Okay. Um, thank you, Tanji, for the introduction. And uh, let me start by saying thank you to Tanji and Monica for pushing this conference forward in light of a pandemic. Um, and thank you to the Fields Institute and to uh, Sarah Pinder for working behind the scenes to help make this happen. This is um, the first time in my life that I'm giving a conference presentation while sitting down. <laughs> so <laughs> new experiences for everyone. <clears throat> um, I, I will also point out that uh, I didn't think about this when I agreed to give a talk on Thursday. Today is garbage day. And it's quite likely the garbage truck is going to drive by my house during the middle of this talk. And so we might get some loud uh, um, truck sounds going on in the background, which will keep things fun. <clears throat> uh, so today I'm going to talk about portfolio optimization um, and a not new approach, but some new results about an old approach. Um, and these new results are coming from, from applying some new tricks to the old approach. It's joint work with uh, Dr. John Braun, who's a statistician. His PhD student, Dong Ying Wang, who helped with some of the uh, statistical analysis near the end. And our postdoc, Dr. Jagdeep Barr. Um, one of the great things about uh, moving this conference to online is Jagdeep was now able to join us. And I can see her on the attendees list. So she's here right now. She has really done uh, most of the heavy lifting in this talk. So it's great that she's here to to watch it and answer any questions that I can't. <laughs> um, okay. Oh, there we go. Good. So uh, I'll start with a quick overview of portfolio optimization. But what I really want to get to is uh, ratio based metal method. So most portfolios, you're going to optimize maximizing returns and minimizing risk or vice versa. Uh, ratio based methods are going to switch that to looking at returns divided by risk to try and get some balance all in one problem. I'm going to show you some modeling tricks comes to linear programming and some tricks that actually date back to the 60s that are going to allow us to rewrite the problem in a method that we can solve extremely efficiently. And that's where the experiments will come in is showing you that that indeed works. So you'll notice that uh, nowhere in this talk do I say Nash equilibrium. So I guess I should apologize for that. That seems to be a common word in most talks. But I think that you will see there's a lot of optimization and variational analysis in here. So hopefully it's still of interest to most of you. Let's start with some classical approaches. So for those of you who have never done any sort of math finance before, a portfolio is a collection of assets, investments. And the idea is, I'm going to talk about stock markets mostly because it just it's easy to, to talk about. You've got hundreds of different stocks that you can choose from. You've got a set amount of money and you want to know how much money you should put into each potential stock. If you put all the money into one stock, then what happens is if that stock goes up, you make a lot of money. If that stock goes down, you lose a lot of money. So you have a very high risk, but a potentially high profit. If you spread your money out more evenly, then your risk goes down because if one stock goes up, another one might go down. Or if one goes down, another one might go up. Your overall profit is probably going to be less, but you have a much lower chance of losing money. And this is in essence what portfolio optimization tries to do. It tries to use mathematics to model how do we get the best collection to maximize profit and minimize risk. <clears throat> so this dates back to the 50s. Uh, Markowitz presented the first model in 1952, um, where he said, what you should do is, is pick some threshold for your risk and then just maximize your expected returns so that your potential risk is below that threshold. Straightforward approach. Of course, you can, you can easily flip it. And that was done almost immediately to say, no, 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 you should minimize your risk such that your expected returns is greater than or equal to some threshold. The one of the current standards is to just pick lots and lots and lots of different thresholds 
giving you a whole bunch of different options. Every time you solve this problem with a different threshold, you'll get a different portfolio. You look at all, through all those portfolios and you make a decision through some process that uh, it's generally a little bit top secret. <clears throat> so let's take a look at this returns and risk model a little more closely before we switch to looking at a ratio based model. First thing is how do we figure out an expected return? <clears throat> so what we assume, assume is that we have a big data set of asset values over time. So asset I at time J has value PIJ. Okay, we might have collected this over a year, over five years, over however long you have. Timestamps could be every day, every 10 minutes, every hour. And we, we collect all that information and we try to make a decision with it. <clears throat> the next thing we do is we take all of this data and we build a bunch of scenarios. So each scenario represents moving time from point J to point J plus L for asset I. We build lots and lots and lots of different scenarios for each asset. So the bigger this data set PIJ is, the more scenarios we can build. And taking all of those scenarios, we can build returns. So the returns in scenario K for asset I is just your closing price minus your opening price. And then we normalize by dividing, dividing by our opening price. So if this number is positive, the asset made money during scenario K. If this number is negative, the asset lost money during scenario K. Your expected returns, you just take the average over a large number of scenarios and you've got it. So expected returns, that's, that's pretty much it. That's pretty standardized. Um, there's not a lot of differences in how you do it. Risk, on the other hand, gets way more complicated. Before we start risk, I'm gonna flip everything backwards. Instead of talking about returns, I'm gonna talk about loss. So loss is just the negative of returns. So what we have so far is a collection of scenarios and in each scenario, we have the return from that scenario, which can give us the loss for that scenario. Expected returns, we just took the expected value. For losses or for, for risk, we're gonna start with a probability function. So we'll build our probability distribution function. So probability distribution function, PDF, of the losses, we'll call that capital X. And then we can build the cumulative distribution function, which is the probability that the losses are less than or equal to some threshold L. Okay, standard uh, statistical approaches here. Given enough scenarios, we can build lots of these and we can get a good cumulative distribution function. Now we could do this um, empirically. So we, we literally take each scenario and give it equal probability and we have an empirical distribution measure. Or we could take all those scenarios and try to fit some smooth Gaussian or, or other form of distribution measure to it. So immediately we have a big variety of how we're going to build our CDF. That gives us a variety of risks right there. But once we've built this, we actually have decisions. What are we going to do? Is risk the probability that the loss is less than some threshold? Or perhaps we look at the expected value of the losses. Or we look at the expected probable loss at some threshold. Or we, and you can daydream up all sorts of different ways to define risk out of this cumulative distribution function. So over the last, 70 years, people have been researching this. Um, and I think there's at least a dozen different types of risk measures. I'm sure there's many, many more. There's a dozen that are reasonably popular in the literature, um, which makes it hard to decide which to pick. And this is a lot of the, the art in how to actually do your portfolio. I'm gonna talk about two of them today. Um, one that is probably the most popular in the literature at the moment. And then the next one is an advancement on that that is gaining traction quickly. So probably the most popular measure of risk used in the literature right now is what's called value at risk. So you're, you select a threshold alpha 
And alpha is going to represent a probability, so it needs to be between 0 and 1. And then you look at the probability, sorry, you look for the minimum L so that the probability that your losses are less than or equal to L is greater than or equal to alpha. So if alpha is set at 5%, 0.05, we're looking for the smallest L such that the probability you lose more than five, more than that money is less than 5%, is greater than 5%. Well, effectively is 5% because this less than or equal, greater than or equal to would become inequality. So whew, let's try and say that again. Once we've worked out this value at risk, what it means is the probability with one minus alpha, the loss will be no more than this value. So if alpha is 5%, your value of risk gives you a number, there's a 95% chance that you will lose no more than that number. Okay, so you can see why that's a nice way to think about risk. Uh, a bank says, okay, I want my value at risk to be 1%. And then you go back and say, okay, there's a 99% chance you will lose no more than this much money if you invest the portfolio in this manner. So this is extremely common. Um, the drawback of this is it ignores the distribution of values beyond that threshold, that one minus alpha. So it might say, okay, there's, there's only a 1% chance that you lose more than this much money, but does that mean you're gonna lose that much money or are you gonna lose something much, much, much bigger than that? You need to know that distribution and a, I think a good value at risk, a good risk measure should contain that distribution. So that's captured in the next one. This is called the conditional value at risk. One of the reasons I had to introduce value at risk is it's right here in conditional value at risk. So same setup as before. Now you pick that threshold alpha and the conditional value at risk gives you the expected value of everything past that value at risk threshold. So what this means is that if you give me a, a number alpha, the conditional value at risk is the expected value of how much you will lose in the worst alpha portions of the outcome. So you say value or my, my threshold is 5%, conditional value at risk says the expected value in the worst 5% of scenarios is this much. <clears throat> so you can see again, that's very nice value at risk in terms of a bank, what they might think and what they might want to use. Um, it's less common because this looks more complicated, but it is gaining traction in the literature and becoming more popular. And what we're gonna to see today is that using this gives us some very nice benefits when looking at ratio-based models. Okay. On to ratio-based models. So remember our two basic models for building a portfolio are maximize expected returns such that risk is below some threshold or minimize risk such that returns are above some threshold. The other way you could do it is you could just say maximize the expected returns divided by the potential risk. So the, the advantage here is there's no longer a need for a threshold. This is one problem and one problem only and it gives you a balanced portfolio in terms of returns and risk. The disadvantage that's been pointed out most of the times is this is not a linear program. I've got a division here. Divisions are harder to optimize. What we're gonna to see today is that if this bottom part, this potential risk is measured in conditional value at risk, we can take this and remodel it as a linear program. Um, like, uh, like our last speaker, we don't, I don't have time for a full literature review, but let me hit a few of the highlights. So this optimization of ratios idea is not new. It dates back to the 60s. In the 60s, this was presented as a, a theoretical model. No discussion on how to actually solve it. Uh, in the early 2000s, uh, Gregorio and Dunyai used value at risk and use the Monte Carlo simulation to actually solve it. So at this point, computers had gotten powerful enough that you could just 
throw hardware at it and, and get a solution. But of course, it's very slow. <clears throat> 19, 2019, so just last year, uh, Segal and Metra used conditional value at risk and they, uh, they used a custom bundle method, a proximal bundle method. So there's another link to the last paper to solve this and it was slow. However, I wanna point out slow in this context means 10 to 15 seconds. So fairly reasonable but banks are kind of pushing towards, they want real-time solutions so they can optimize their portfolios anytime they want with no delay. <clears throat> so here's our model. Expected returns over potential risk. Our returns is clearly a linear function because Y is just the vector of losses. And so the negative Y is a, the vector of expected returns. We multiply it by or dot product with X, which is our portfolio distribution. Subject to X is in some reasonable set. So we've got lower bounds on how much you can spend in each portfolio. That's typically zero. Upper bounds, that forces you to diversify a little bit. So you might say no more than 10% of my money goes into any given asset. And then you need to have the sum of the X i is equal to one. All of these are linear constraints. So no problems here. And then you've got this division by CVAR. That's the part that uh, turns this and makes it a nonlinear program. So the next step we're gonna do is we're gonna take this CVAR and we're gonna pull up a formula that was developed by Rockefeller and Urasev back in 2000. It says that if you've got a finite list of scenarios, then you can calculate CVAR as the minimum of this gigantic function. So this plus sign here means take the maximum with something and zero. That looks nonlinear at a glance, but as we all know, that's just the maximum of two linear functions. So you can turn that into a linear function using a constraint. All of this summation, there's a lot of it, but it's all multiplied by a constant and xi minus l. So that's all linear. This pi is the probability of any given scenario. So it's constant determined by the data. One over alpha, one minus alpha is a constant and L here is of course linear still. So the beauty here is this version of CVAR is a linear problem in itself. And if I embed a linear program into a linear program, I still get a linear program. So let's do that. Expected returns over potential risk now looks like this. Very big, very complicated. I'm going to assume that plus sign can be remodeled as a linear program, which means I can take this and assume that maximum returns over potential risk is a linear objective over a linear objective subject to a series of linear constraints. That's a good setup. It's still a nonlinear problem, but if we look through some of the techniques and tricks in working with linear programs, we realize that this particular problem can be remodeled as a linear program. Um, so this goes back to the 60s, where Charns and Cooper showed the following tricks to change this linear program into, or this nonlinear program into a linear program. We introduced two new variables, t and z. t is one over the bottom, and z is x times one over the bottom. So if I multiply the bottom here, the denominator over to t, I get t times p transpose x is equal to one. In the z variable, recognize one over p transpose x is t, so I have z equals tx. Take the tx right here, and notice it's right here, tx. t is a scalar, so I can move it into the inner product, and I get p transpose z equals one, and z equals tx. So I've remodeled this nonlinear program as the following linear program by adding a bunch of extra constraints and introducing this new variable. So in the, in the paper, uh, and as I said, a lot of the heavy lifting is figuring out exactly what these R hats and P's and stuff are, but you can work it all out just by going through and very carefully working through the equations and doing that. The end result is that I can take that returns over risk model and when using CVAR, write it as a linear program. 
Now there's a catch. Right here, I've got this t greater than or equal to zero assumption. If t becomes negative, then we end up with some, some bad stuff happening because we've done a lot of divisions and multiplications and I've got e inequality signs floating around. But in the case of returns over risk, you can dig down and say, what does that mean? So t greater than or equal to zero means that your conditional value at risk must be greater than or equal to zero for all x and there has to be at least one portfolio where this sum, this negative y i x i is greater than zero. Bringing that back to real world language, conditional value at risk greater than or equal to zero for all x means that every asset has a risk to it. So conversely, if there's a asset where the conditional value at risk is strictly negative, that means that asset has a guaranteed profit. Banks know what to do with that one. So let's just take that one, throw it away, and, and reduce the problem to not have any of this. The negative losses being bigger than zero for one X means that there's at least one portfolio where you're making an expected return. Or said another way, if that, if that uh, negative loss is always negative, that would mean every single portfolio in this problem loses money. Banks know what to do about that too. They just change their interest rates. <laughs> okay, so these two conditions um, may be restrictive in some settings, but in the terms of portfolio optimization, they're extremely reasonable. That's my time. Good. Okay, I'm just going to end with a quick case study. Um, the case study, we, we built a lot of problems and we wanted to answer two questions. The first is, we had to introduce a bunch of new variables to change this to a linear program. Can we still solve it in a reasonable time? You know, linear programs are fast, but if the number of variables gets big enough, they become slow. And the second is, is this even doing anything? Or are we just resolving the same thing in a different way? So here's our setup. Uh, we did a returns oriented model, a risk oriented model, and our returns over risk model. We solved it with a simplex method and with an interior point method. We used stock market pricing from the Dow Jones, the NASDAQ, and the S&P 500 uh, for about eight years worth of data. And using various time horizons and various subsets of stocks, we made about 480 case studies. So we have quite a few test problems to play with. Here's our time to solve chart. Notice there's a log scale on both axes. Um, this log is in the natural logarithm, which means that this line right here is about 200 stocks, um, or sorry, an in-sample size of about 200, making it on par with Segal and Metra's approach. Although we're only using 40 stocks and they use 200. This log right here says that even in the very worst case, we took under a second to solve it. But more importantly, in the smaller cases, we're looking at e to the negative four seconds. It's very, very fast. We're, we're talking about thousands of a second. Pushing the number of stocks up to the maximum level, 440 stocks. Um, even with M sample sizes of 200, we're solving it at e to the negative two seconds, that's significantly faster than 13 seconds. We're looking at a hundredth of a second instead of 13, so about a hundred times, a thousand times faster. Um, at this point, we really see that, that the interior point method approach is not helping. In fact, it's going quite a bit slower than every other method. So what we want to use is a simplex method to solve this problem and what we find is the fractional model can be solved essentially the exact same time as the non-fractional approaches using a simplex method. So that's good. Banks are happy with that. Um, they don't want something that's slower. They want something that's faster. This is the same speed, maybe a little faster. In terms of giving it different answers, so here's our risk, our returns, and our fractional model. The way you read this graph is we're looking at predicted returns minus actual returns. So if the line is above the number zero, that means that you predicted better returns than you got. 
And if the line is below zero, it means your predicted worse returns than you got. Lines near zero are, are generally better. Mo banks like models that the output matches the results. Um, so the fact that this fractional model is in between the other two makes it uh, something that uh, fairly useful perhaps in practice. However, when we push the out of sample size up to longer, we can see things got very chaotic. Um, so it's not perfectly clear which model is the best thing to do here. What we can definitely say is the fraction model gives a balanced portfolio and it gives different portfolios than the other two methods tested. So at the very least, it's giving a new insight and a new starting point for building portfolios. And it can be solved in reasonable time, so that's a plus. And I think I'm gonna finish just about on time. So I hope what you gathered from this, and it was a very quick talk, and, and I hope it sunk in a little bit, is uh, portfolios can be created by optimization. There are three competing techniques, returns-based, risk-based, ratio-based. Uh, through remodeling, we've shown that the ratio-based, if you're using conditional value at risk as the denominator, as opposed to other values at risk, can be remodeled as an LP and therefore solved efficiently. And, and so now is actually a reasonable approach to working on such problems. And that um, is my talk for today. Thank you for 